Welcome back to another episode of Explicit Measures Podcast with Tommy, Seth, and Mike. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. For those of you joining live, you'll see that uh, a new uh, an arrival has occurred on the swag.powerbi store, and I'm wearing it today. Copilot tab, tab, I am me. <laughs> uh, I can't read it backwards. Oh, Copilot told me to say it. <laughs> So that's my new shirt. So I'll uh, I'll put the link if you if you like this shirt here with the nice copilot symbol on the front and uh, some funny words on there. I'll I'll put the the link up here for you as well. So if you want to join in and um, uh, get your own uh, shirt if you want, there's a uh, there's a shirt out there as well. So that'll be there. Sick, 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 Mike. Kind of fun stuff. It is fun. If you show up at any conference, I'm probably going to be wearing one of these things now. <laughs> teasing Copilot now. We'll see what ha- we'll see how much trouble I can get in. So, anyways, <sighs> and the and the shirt's name is Skynet is coming. So, for those of you who Skynet like Terminator, Skynet is here. <laughs> Skynet is here. Yes, Skynet exactly is here. Right. <laughs> that reminds me, we we uh, we had an organizational event not long ago, and we were talking about AI, and uh, <laughs> we were just throwing out ideas for you know ways in which we can improve the business us- utilizing it. Yeah, and uh, I, I stood up. We had a little group session for my group, and I, I, I was like, um, before I get started, I just want to you know, um, I just want to say that I, I for one, look forward to uh, the new takeover of our new overlords. Uh, so uh, whenever. And however they want to do that, uh, they're probably listening through the speakers already. My name is Seth Bauer, and uh, I'm all for it. <laughs> uh. That's true, though. I mean, it's it's like uh, you know, it's it's almost it's changing my behavior because I'm I'm literally talking to my microphone in meetings. Seems like okay, co-pilot, I'm making notes oh. for you now because I know you're yeah. reading my transcript. Right. So here's the notes I want you to hear, co-pilot. So it's going to know all these things about how we're so talking and what we're talking, talking about. about yeah. it I, I don't have to do anything in meetings now. I have uh, two services called Read AI and Fireflies. I'm like, Fred, Fred's the service name. You go, you'll take care of it. I'm not even going to pay attention. And it's so great. It's insane. Fred's got it. Fred's got, got it. it. So you, can, you, found a, you found something that you can name? Well, that's the name that he, they gave it. They're like, hey, talk oh. to Fred about your meeting. And I go, I hey, want to name it myself. Little stuff, mini stuff. No, no, no I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it Mike DiCarlo. <laughs> Mike DiCarlo, please Mike summarize DiCarlo. my meetings. Please summarize this. Maybe Take I, out your notepad. <laughs> I'm gonna try to change the name to Seth Bauer. <laughs> so let's do a couple intros here, real quick, and then we'll jump into our main topic. Our main topic for today is we're actually going to talk about some recent features that have just appeared in Power BI Desktop. Uh, one of them being Copilot, which is kind of why we're starting the talk here with Copilot. And the second one being this new format called Timdl, T-M-D-L. It's a format that Power BI Desktop is going to start using. It's in preview still, so it's still in preview. However, this is going to be, I think, a helpful feature for those of us who are going to check things in and look at um, building reports with code or building reports and storing them inside Git. So we'll talk about that as our main topic. But before we get started, let's talk about a couple little openers here. Uh, and our first opener, it really is around, um, there is a Microsoft conference that's coming out. So the Microsoft conference is having a Microsoft Fabric conference, and you can go visit that at azuredataconf.com. And then it is on March 26th through to the 28th, if you want to join. There are workshops on the 24th and the 25th, so the two days before the main conference. And there's a post-con workshop on the 29th. Uh, you can use a discount code of Carlo100 for $100 off your tickets. I'll be speaking at two uh, sessions there, one around um, data flows and pipelines, all that new Fabric Gen 2 stuff, and then also talking about Spark and how to optimize and look at your Spark, uh, read the Spark engine and what's going on inside your Power BI environment or your Fabric environment. So I'll be talking there at the conference. It's going to be a good sessions, I think. There's going to be a lot of great learning uh, elements there as well. So feel free to, to join us. We'd love to see you there. The other announcements we have here is um, kind of around uh, this new Copilot preview. So uh, something that we picked up on. So February desktop has been released. You can go download it now off of the Microsoft Store. If you go to like the, it's funny because I can't really go to Power BI. You can't go to PowerBI.com anymore. It like immediately redirects you to app.powerbi.com. So I have to go to like blog 
.com to get the homepage. So that's what I do now. So I go to blog.powerbit.com and then there you can click on products and then go download the most recent desktop version. But um, before, when you go to download, there's a whole bunch of new preview features. And one of the preview features uh, that we talked about on there and we found inside the new release for this month was you can now add measure descriptions with Copilot. And there's a Microsoft blog post about this as well. Uh, gentlemen, your thoughts on making a measure descriptions with Copilot? Heck yeah, sign me up. <laughs> um, I, I want to give the right credit, but I th I think it's someone who worked for Tableau Editor 3, and they actually created a macro a few months ago um, where it would actually go through all of your measures and use chat mm. to the measure. <clears throat> I think that was Darren um, Gospel in, I, I think in, you're right. yeah, in yeah, Dax yeah. Studio. And I think he used instead of using Copilot, he was using Chat no, GPT three or something. Using some, a Tableau editor, um, Tableau editor macro. Yeah, and he was going. He was he had written a little script that was using the the token and the API call, going to Chat GPT, passing it the measure and saying, "Describe this measure." And I remember in one. Um, Dan Godspell, yeah. I remember in one. Um, evening session of a user group we decided to have it write all the descriptions in italian so you could you could change the name of the language you wanted to write it back in so you could have it describe the measure in italian and write the measure descriptions back for you inside your model which was funny because then none of the users in america could read it because it's in english <laughs> so they wouldn't know what it was but an italian wrote it so it has to be right that's what I always tell everyone I train. But no, I mean, this This has been out since um, I probably think the last six months. And I have it in Tableau Editor 3, and I still use it uh, to create descriptions. But now that that's already integrated, this is uh, just the start. Well, to be clear, making descriptions with measures was not an out-of-the-box experience. This was a experience that someone had to create with a script. So the scripting feature, the extra code if you are a tablet editor user could have been done like for months. However, Microsoft has taken note. And this is something that we've talked about on the podcast a lot. It was like, there's no reason I don't, I don't, this is a low hanging fruit. We should not have to describe measures anymore. We should be able to throw it at, a, at an AI and have it kind of start the wording of what that description of that column table and or measure would be doing. And again, it's, it's something where you have to still read it. You're not going to just create it and walk away. Uh, but I do think over time it'll get better, and then at least it gives you a starting point to describe what that measure is doing. I thought I so this is just post now, so there isn't the official blog describing this yet. No, 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 there is now, right? Well, there it's, is a blog. There is a, an official one, blog post around generate measure okay. descriptions with Copilot. Yeah, that is so that's officially it's out. In preview. By it's in preview way. right now. It reads like it's a one by one though, right? Reads like a one by one. I'm not sure. I understand. Um, every measure has to go through the properties, click copilot, as opposed to, isn't oh, Darren's I see. like across the board? Or was that also one by one? Um, I think you could pass, I think you could actually, and, well, and, and you can always, again, with Darren's example, I think you can modify the script to allow you to select multiple measures and it could just do yeah. an entire group of them if you selected them. I, I think it's something that's selectable. I would imagine if it's in preview, you may be doing one at a time right now, but maybe in the future you could multi-select. I think if you're on the modeling page, I think you could actually select multiple measures on the modeling page and, and try this out. Either way, I'm super stoked. Like This is the kind of stuff that when we talk about the pain in the rear, nobody wants to do it, but you has to. Or mm -hmm. like if it doesn't have to, but like you should <laughs> put the descriptions on things. Yeah. Um, this is exactly where like AI should cut corners for people. Cut, now, cut time off of things. For yeah, exactly. Cut corners. This is not a corner cutting. This is just is not saving time. So one of the things here that's interesting here is this Copilot feature, and this is what I don't quite understand yet how Microsoft's handling this licensing for Copilot. Fabric Copilot is at a different level of pay than everything else that I've seen for Copilot across the Microsoft suite. Like, for example, if I want Copilot in Excel, Word, or other, like, just I want Copilot in Teams, I can go out to the Microsoft Store and buy Copilot per user. 
So I can buy one for in a license for a user, and then mm -hmm. that leverages Copilot. When I look at this enabling Copilot inside Fabric, you're only allowed to get it on an F64 or a P1 capacity when you do not have a trial enabled. So you may be able to read this article, you may want to use this, but unless you're paying for a P1 or F64, full out, not a trial, that's the only time you can actually get what this looks like. So you're, you're not going to be able to try the Copilot features until you pay for the thing which I, I feel is a little bit of a barrier to entry because, I mean, yes, I think people are going to want it. But now I feel like this adds value at lower ends of the spectrum. I, like if I'm already paying for Copilot as a user, I want to use it in desktop. Maybe I don't use it in the service, but maybe I want to use it for me. I don't know. I just feel like, the, I feel like there's a little bit of a gap here for like how we can get this to work for, for individual users as opposed to the entire fabric capacity. Yeah, but isn't I, isn't that the whole deal though? Like, I do you th do you think that the easy button type things that AI capabilities introduce should be a free for all, or is this is the is it fair? It's that not. It's, it's not that I'm no, no no no. I'm not arguing free or not. I'm arguing why do I have to pay for a f a co pilot license for Michael in my tenant and. Mm -hmm. I have to go pay for a co-pilot license at a fabric level. Like everything else I've been expl exploring with, with co-pilot has been at the individual user level. So I want it to be like an and condition as opposed to an, an I want it to be an or condition, not an and condition, right? If, I, if you pay for a co-pilot for the user, I still want to use those features even though I'm a pro user because I'm paying extra money for co-pilot. Just give it to me. On the other hand, co-pilot for what though? For fabric. So you're you're saying you have to pay co-pilot for fabric and have an F64? Mm -hmm. No, no. You have to pay co-pilot for Word, Excel, Teams, okay. and you have to buy so a certain SKU for, inside fabric oh, high enough that co-pilot will even turn on, even though oh, I'm paying so for it need, personally. You need the 365 license and not yeah. and it's an or completely separate. It's yeah. completely separate. They're not linked. That's what my problem is. They're not linked. I'm confused. I know so, exactly my point. <laughs> this my is what... Office Copilot has nothing to do with Power BI. Yes. If yeah. I buy Office Copilot, it doesn't help me get Copilot in Fabric. And okay. you can't get Power BI Copilot for an individual user. Again, which is strange. Is it? Mm -hmm. No, it's only on the. It's only on. No, 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 no. Is it strange? Is what I guess I'm saying. Like so. Um, if I'm, if I'm looking at Copilot for X, because there are multiple different products for Copilot, or I should say you have Copilot for office, you have Copilot for whatever you have Copilot. There's at least four or five or six that I know of, right? That are all individually licensed, aren't they? And then you also have Copilot for fabric and Power BI is now part of that ecosystem. So if you want to play in that space, especially with like the capabilities of whatever's now present and coming, that's the fabric license. That's like that is AI in that license, which don't get me wrong, this this calling it the same thing across all these things and licensing them differently is going to be very costly. One, but two is confusing, which I agree, but it's a Different, different. I'm not aware of any of other. AI, I guess I'm not aware of any other copilot things that you pay for. Like it's either you pay for uh, Office no, copilot. I, when I was looking this up, um, because or I was like, Fabric copilot, right? Or is there more? There I didn't even know there was more. There are more. Let me look them up. I think the Power Apps ones, but no, because those are not included with Office, like the business applications. I think they were giving that away for free. And then there's, there's a there's Copilot Studio, which is completely separate though too, because that's building them. Yeah, again, if you're using Azure, are you paying for that separately? Too, and I'm not sure. Separate. Yeah, but it's like you're you're us, utilizing Azure uh, machine learning at that point and AI with all that, so you're already off the spear now. I mean, compared to that to, Copilot, that to me, Copilot Studio thing, I think makes sense because you know you're developing your own. Like that makes sense a little bit more to me. Like you're building your own type of Copilot. Okay, fine, that makes more sense. 
I just don't understand how the licensing works yet, how it all intersects. And it, and it feels like this very disjointed, like every team or product team has their own flavor of what Copilot's doing to design it for what they're doing in their projects. But I just, it just feels very disjointed. Copilot's like this very generic term of like, oh, it's AI. Copilot for GitHub or Copilot for Git. Copilot for Office, now Copilot for Fabric. And so you're going to be spending like $100 a month just to get Fabric, to get Copilot features? No, I don't think so. Anyways, I don't know. It's confusing me. It just makes me feel better that I got you the best Christmas present from Secret Santa, which is Copilot. Which is, not even yeah, was, yeah, which, it, is, which it was free. It, you it was just part of it. It free. Just given to me? Yeah, that was big great. Anyways, moving on from that interesting uh article. We'll figure it out eventually. We'll figure it out eventually. There'll probably be an episode on how to how to work with copilot Co-pilot licensing just just like power bi licensing when it first came out oh yeah <laughs> it's gonna be so confusing oh my word yeah not fun let's let's transition over to our main uh topic for today let's transition transition over to uh timdal support inside power bi desktop this is a preview feature that you can go turn on in power bi desktop so one you need to go out and download the most recent version of power bi desktop that's the first thing you need to do and then second thing is you need to go into the preview feature. So you have to click the little gear in the right-hand side of your Power BI desktop, get into the settings, go into preview features. And then when you're inside preview features, you can turn on use the PBIP format. And also you can turn on the use the Timdal format. So now you can open your reports and you can save your report as a PBIP, which is stands for Power BI project. And when you save out the file, it will save the data model side as a Timdal format. So it will no longer be in JSON and it will no longer, your data model will no longer be a single very large model.bim file. It'll now be broken into many components, which is pretty stinking cool if you ask me. So that's kind of the overview very briefly of, of Timbal, Timdal here. Um, let's jump in with uh, how we feel about it. What are your guys' initial thoughts? Does this make sense? Do we think people are going to, are going to use this? We should probably should back up why we're spending so much time and why we're so excited about a code or sure. a Tyler module definition language. Um, just real quick, because may, uh, I think a lot of people have had the great benefit and the pleasure of not having to deal with a Tom or um, this type of language before. This has been around for a while, or at least the, the concept of the TOM, uh, Tabular mod- Object Model, the, mo- the scripting language, a lot of things that have run for years before Power BI. And as you try to get more into it, if you, I'm sure you guys have as well with MDX or with ta- uh, Tabular Editor macros, or just trying to automate a little more from the back of your data, it's almost impossible because it's such a completely different foreign language on how to reference something, um, the different functions. I think it's, what is it, C Sharp or the back end uh, or C++? So something that you're not ever really using and which made it hard to do any advanced development or try to codify it. With Timdal, this, again, new, new um, feature that's really coming out is rather than being in again that kind of uh encrypted language where it's good for computers bad for humans um it's in a language called yaml and the way it actually breaks out the uh all the text and your metadata is good for computers to read and process and also excellent for humans to read and process and that's the big difference here yeah i mean let's let's go i mean if you're talking about like history of things right so Back in back in the day, right? There's no version control for Power BI. You, you don't have any way of checking in things and seeing what version of files. So people have pretty much adopted, for my for my intents and purposes, people have adopted the ability of when I make a Power BI file, either a data set or a semantic model, Power yeah. BI report or a thin report, a thick or thin report, whatever you want to call it. Those things, those objects, where do you save them? Where do you put them? And some of these files, these PBIX files that you were saving previously could get quite large. If you have a lot of data tables in there, you could have a multiple gig file that lives somewhere. And so I think what you find is in IT shops or business intelligence teams that come out of the IT space, 
they want to save these files somewhere and they're trying to do it with Git. And Git does not like very large files like that. So because the report and the model, semantic model, were saved as very large files, this posed a challenge. And I think, Seth, you've run into this a number of times. Like when you publish things out to the service, how do you know what changed? How do you, how do you check some of the quality of like the models that we're producing and how do they get out the door? These are common IT-based challenges that you would use in IT, but the business doesn't care about those things. They're just get stuff done, make a Power BI file, publish it, be done, move on. Uh, but I think there's more resilience as you, as you think about governance and security and making sure that these solutions don't break over time. I think this is what you're speaking to, Tommy. Previously, we didn't have a, a pattern. Like only the super technical people could get access to this stuff because it was so JSON heavy. It was so technically heavy. Like it, th all that has existed for many, many years. Like it's been, you know, I don't know, decades, I guess, 10 years plus that this stuff has been built, but it was just not very business user friendly. Let me say it that way. Is that, does that sound like yeah. a good statement? C certainly not yeah. business user friendly. Um, yeah. And with, even in tools like pre Power BI with tabular models in Visual Studio, right? Everybody's with yeah. VS, VS Code, et cetera. Like deploying things was a step by step process. And even as you're describing things now, um, I, I would I would argue the vast majority of Power BI implementations don't even try to use Git or some sort of source control. Oh, totally. Because, it's, because it is extremely technical. Yep. And, um, <laughs> Honestly, for the amount of effort for not a good solution, it's easier to use SharePoint, ALM yep. Toolkit, and just a SQL Jeez. Server. Fun. Right? Yep. Like, Ship it. I, mm -hmm. I can do all of those. Like, But still, at the same time, if I want to make a change and deploy it, or I need to go you know, modify something, the largest challenge has been break fixing because there's no checks and balances because you can't source control stuff. So to find like, break fixing, because I'm not sure if in, everyone's heard what that means. Well, <laughs> deploy it, you break it, now you have to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> a break, a broken fix. Like you, you, you thought you, you fixed it, you, you fixed something, it, but you break something else, right? right? Something like that. Yeah. So ultimately, it, like the juice is not worth the squeeze here, right? And no. it hasn't been, um, unless you had extremely technical folks that were very comfortable in these areas. Correct. And even then, because there's so many limitations, um, and, and you are, you're using a lot of third-party tools. You're, mm -hmm. um, you know, still struggling with separation of things, making sure they combine. How do you verify, validate, et cetera. Um, within that, like there are great tools. I love ALM Toolkit. I think it's fantastic. But you get very familiar with what, what you shouldn't do, <laughs> what you shouldn't do directly on the analysis services instance yep. that works, right? As opposed to, um, you know, th doing things the right way. So for all of these challenges that exist and there are pseudo solutions, and when I mean pseudo, it's like, oh, somebody comes up with a, an easier-ish way to do it, but it's still missing a couple pieces. Yep. Tim Dill is starting to change that and like push us in a direction of an actual method to introduce the the things that we're missing in a unified fashion and that's what's exciting about it is like we're now moving closer to having something that gets us to a full source control whereby if you're going to teach new people a new process it will work hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, seamlessly end to end. And I want to, I want to be also clear here. I think it's not solely Timdall alone that's pushing us this direction. Right. I think it's also the PBIP format. That's also mm -hmm. a very big part of this as well, because, you know, Timdall is, is focusing on the model side, right? T taking, and again, if you were familiar with some of the very technical tools, tabular editor would do, could save a model to files or save a model to a folder. So in Tabular Editor, you could go open a model, save it down to a lot of little tiny files, still in JSON format, but at least the entire semantic model was broken out into smaller objects. So that way, if I change a measure, I could see where that measure was changed if I you know, track this over time or other things that were helping out with that as well. So I feel like that's been very useful. 
uh, to be able to have these other tools. Now, one one comment around your your other tools, Seth, because I, I agree with you 100%. Previously, we had to use other tools like ALM Toolkit, Tabular Editor 2, Visual Studio was another one. I think remember I remember building initial models with Visual Studio and having to deploy things it was such a pain. And the program kept crashing all the time. It was just so unhelpful to work in. It no, was like almost useless. Nobody useful. liked working with Tabular. No. Was there was the like VS, there was like ever. SSD tools or something else you had to install inside VS Code and mm -hmm. Visual Studio. And it was like, it was just such a mess. I hated, absolutely hated deploying models through Visual Studio because it was just so mm -hmm. clunky and it broke all the time. Yeah. So that being said, there's some pushback from organizations that would say, we don't allow third-party tools. If Microsoft doesn't let us control it, we cannot use third-party tools. Yeah. So that for some companies, anything technical related was a was an immediate blocker and a stoppage. They can't develop with this stuff. They couldn't. Well, in large part, yeah, it. in large part, like um, there's a lot of organizations, especially the larger you get, where every service you have to use has to go through checks and balances. So it's a like a vetting system. You, yeah. Right. Like even if your reason is. Listen, guys, we're we're deploying things, or we're having to redeploy entire models and reports, and it's yep. costing us a lot of money. And this one tool just lets us make changes. And we're like, okay, well, you know, we'll have to talk. Uh, yes, we'll have to talk about that a little more. <laughs> we'll have to run that through security and see what yeah, they say. Yeah. And yeah. some organizations yeah. just say, no, you can't install that thing on your machine, or yeah. no, you can't yeah. have it, or and no, it won't work. Yeah. And then, and now you're stuck. So now you're spent using more time to slowly go through these things. And then I think what you find is the business gets frustrated and goes off and either does well, this on a different case, machine and but you data leaves the organization right. accidentally because people are trying to use these tools on computers they can and then bringing the files back over. So like, I think it creates problems. So I, 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 to your point, I don't want to, I don't want to say Timdall is giving us all that. Correct. It's not. It is, it is, the like a big step forward towards yes. making all of that integration work and that is exciting um n uh, like on two two facets from my perspective one is the actual simplification of how we manage things um but also that they're thinking about this being a problem area for enterprise solutions like we're discussing and okay. the challenges around that so to have a product that works seamlessly end to end and offers a integrated way in which we can you know manage and um make better deployments of changes into mm -hmm. an enterprise ecosystem uh is is i'm super excited about well honestly the big thing too is and mike i think you actually put that in the uh, the post that put this on on online on twitter yep. x um, we're, we've always talked about the developer side with Tim Dill and GitHub repos and Git repos and the Power BI projects, sure. but there is some, there is something very unique here. If Tablet Editor 3 is the Power BI's professional tool of choice, and I'll keep saying, even as Marco Russo said, if you use Power BI once a month, you need Tablet Editor 3. Um, and if that's a developer tool with Tim Dill, we have the text in a very easy to human read format. And this is something we've always talked about is our data lives in that, in the data set and lives in the service, but how do we translate it into our, our descriptions from the business? The, the link that you sent was like, Hey, we can just use Tim Dill and write copilot to it because it's basically text fields. Uh, and it's, it's just YAML, which is very human computer readable. So is, it, can, is it YAML or YAML esque? Yeah, it's not YAML directly. Well, so YAML is yet yeah. another markup lang language. So it's very similar to YAML, but it's not the exact. So Microsoft took YAML and I think derived a similar pattern and how they're doing this. So YAML is very Python-esque where it like the number of indents matters. Spacing matters, right? Where you put code on different lines matters, but it is just a text file. So you can go get the... I think that's I think that's I think it's close to YAML, but it's not the actual same thing. So I think that's, that's I think it's it's close there as well. 
but Microsoft has has borrowed like the the methodology of what YAML is doing, and then just made it easier to read. And I think Tommy, to your point though, the challenge is I don't want to have to like it's all the it's all the doodads that go along with JSON. Like so, what happens here? I think behind the scenes is you write things in Timdle, Timdle gets read by desktop. Timdle then gets translated back into a JSON object and then gets shoved back into a model.bim. So essentially everything that runs in powerbi.com is still running on a JSON file that's generated. But these these are all files that are being used and interpreted that are easy to consume from us. And I think your point there, Tommy, is very well taken. Like, yeah. The reason this is amazing is because I can look at it and it's it can has it has coloring, it's very easy to read. The indentations make a lot of sense. It's very logical and how it is outlined, which makes it very easy for us to like make changes. So if I want to go look at a format string or edit something, it's very easy. And I'll also echo this too. There's no more curly braces. There's no more commas. There's no more nested objects. All that stuff goes away and all of the syntax of JSON disappears. And then we can focus on what we really care about, which is what's the name of the column? What's the data type of the column? Does it have a formatting for string? What does that look like? Like we can, it can be more specific around exactly what we're doing on the actual data. And it's much clearer to read because a lot of the properties that we don't care about are just not showing. See, and, and this, that alone, Mike, is, I think can't be understated. So a lot of, it is, yeah, it's basically the animal uh, syntax and the structure mm -hmm. from the indenting, and we don't have to worry about spaces or uh, brackets and quotations. And a lot, the, what languages use YAML uh, or like what tooling? Your GitHub pages, uh, um, I think it, there's a lot of, in a sense, human readability with YAML that I love that with how, why the Microsoft team's going there. We're also, too, we can feed this in to other services. Mm -hmm. If now we just have text fields, obviously we've talked about the Git in great detail. Um, I don't think that's anything that we have, uh, um, I'm, and we will continue to. But having the YAML file and being able to quickly edit or verify, but also now that we can utilize tools like Copilot, uh, the GitHub version, I guess, or um, other things for us to simply copy and paste, like, hey, chat TPT or sending, uh, you know, something, a uh, piece of the code or snippet to someone to take a look where they don't have to open the entire file. This is, there's, um, to me, that's where the bigger impact is because we've known what Git's going to do in the version history, but I think we're now seeing the other implications of it. Yeah, to be clear, my post on Twitter was not connecting Timdle and right. Copilot together. I was just picking out the features that I found in desktop that were now recently announced, right? So, you know, there, there's no, I'm not trying to say Timdle and Copilot go together yet. Um, maybe that will in the future, but for right now, those are just two distinct features that I found really interesting in the February release of desktop. But in the future, maybe there's something there where you're going to feed the Timdle format over to uh, Copilot and Copilot will be able to read through it. What I find most, well, not interesting, but one of the things looking forward to the most, I guess, is we we open this discussion with our clear disdain of the previous Visual Studio solution. But looking looking back at Rui's original post around the preview of Timbital, like mm -hmm. their their goal is to create an, a, an extension for Visual Studio, so mm -hmm. uh, quite quite ambitious to change all of our our previous negative experiences into positive ones. <laughs> and is it Visual Studio or VS Code? Because I believe it's for Visual, VS Code. Visual or maybe Studio. it works for both automatically, I don't know. Well, you're right, v VS Code extension. Extension. VS and code. I'll, I will, I'll be the first one to admit, if I'm developing in different pieces of software, I will choose VS Code over mm -hmm. Visual Studio any day. Sure. Because VS Code is so much more lightweight, seems to be 100% less buggy, and when I want an an added package, what, what do they call them, Tommy? What's the things they they have on the other side here? It's like the extensions. extensions. If I want an extension, oh, they work well. Yeah. They install easy, and they just seem to like Dude, they update and I when they need it. to. I, I I get it. From our perspective, we never sh we should have always had something like v VS Code. Like, totally, we never should have been introduced to no. the Visual Studio world. No, we 
the robustness of that yes. tool for all of the things that it built for many years and developed. Oh, totally. Land. Oh, totally. Was like, it was like throwing people who had no idea what they were doing in that arena into that arena. And that's exactly the outcome that you would expect. Yeah. It's like, what? Chaos well, and other yeah. disaster. We, we learned. We adapted. Yeah. Or, or we just left it alone <laughs> and just walked away. Yeah. From it. It, was, it was more of like we just like ignored it and went away. Just said, this is not going to work for us. Let's get away from this. Oh, we were fortunate. Power BI came out and said, nah, come over here. <laughs> get over <laughs> here. Get over here. It's like, uh, what, what are those guys from like uh, Mortal Kombat? It's, you know, yeah, the guy, get over here. Get over here. Let's go to Scorpion. That's Scorpion, that's Scorpion. what I was thinking Sorry, about. Yeah. I shouldn't know that so well. But yeah, that was Scorpion. We can go through all that. Anyways. Um, <laughs> oh, good times. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go as far as saying here some else, something else that I think is very interesting. So one, the Timdal format works fairly well, and one thing I haven't done testing on, and I'm actually trying to test as we're on the podcast right now is, okay. So for example, let's imagine that you have Power BI Desktop open. You're going to save a model as the PBIP format, and you're going to keep the Timdal formatting on. So that means it's going to save the model in the Timdal format, which is very great. I love it. What happens when you publish that Timdal file into PowerBI.com? And what happens when you sync that new model with your Git repo? Do you see in the Git repo Timdal formatted files, or does it still stay as the model.bim? So I'm going to go check that right now. I'll let you know uh, if I can get in there and open up the repo, and I'll, I'll check it to make sure. But I, I think... If it's not happening right now, I would imagine moving forward, you should be able to see the Timdal formatted files inside your, your repo. And I'm just going to confirm if it's there or not. Do you want music? Do, 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 do. No, I don't, I don't. I think I just added it here and I don't think it's there yet. So it, it, it may be still using the model.bim format currently. So I'm, I, I saved a file. I... Saved it in the Timdal format, and I'm just going to confirm I actually did do it correctly on my desktop here. But I think the round robin trip here of going desktop to service into Git would make sense if it stays in that Timdal format all the way through. But I don't know if it's going to do that right now initially, and I don't think my initial testing is showing that it's. It doesn't look like it's doing it right now. Yeah, that's pretty slightly worrying. Well, but also like it's hot it, off the press. It, I mean, it's in preview it, right, right now. They're still figuring it, things out. Right. Like, how do you cut over to it? What do, what do you mean by that? Well, if like, do I have to redeploy? I would assume I'm redeploying all my models. I would imagine so. And then at the same time, then like, man, confusing. So like if the third party tools like tabular letter to ALM toolkit, probably at tools, whatever. Yep. yep. Adopt the new format. Do you have two versions of your tool or does it just play? Just consume whatever you're using. You know, ooh, this could get tricky, right? I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying because you, you kind of need. I mean, when they re, when they release this, you kind of have to wait for all the other tooling to kind of catch up. I mean, is it are they all going to jump in on this bandwagon and start producing these Timdal type files all at once? My understanding is like when you save when you save a if you're in desktop and you're working with a Timdal formatted PBIP project it takes that project and it compresses it into PBIX and then sends the PBIX up to the service to publish it. It doesn't necessarily grab the Timdal files and like say, oh, we're going to keep them in Timdal format and then send it up. So I don't know yet. I'm not sure how this is going to work. This is interesting. It'd be interesting to see if it's just part of the deployment or if it's actually changing the structure of the model and how we interact with it in the tabular models. Because that'll because, change things. Yeah, that's that's impactful. Yeah, because, well... Like technically, can you imagine if you didn't my my have a migration path. Like if it required changes, you wouldn't want a, an environment, at least from the enterprise level, that had different versions of things and different mm -hmm. deployment strategies and ways to do stuff. Oh, that would be bad. That'll be it, it. Like it'll be interesting to see how they come out with like, hey, here's here's a way. <laughs> well. Will they come out with a, hey, here's a way in which you can migrate onto this? Or does it just plug and play and work? And I would, I, I don't It's got to be somewhat backwards compatible no matter what. It just has to be. 
You can't you can't roll out a hard a hard uh, fork like this so much. Not necessarily. I mean, I guess you could technically do it, but I would I would I would like it to be as a developer of this, I would like it to be backwards compatible. Yeah. So whether I'm deploying a model with the model.bim or I decide I'm going to transition and I'm going to do Timdle, it should be an easy transfer from one format to another. Because ideally, you're not losing anything. There's no data you're missing. It's just the structure. It, it's just the structure's changing. So there's nothing that's gone. You're not taking away things. It's just reformatting it in a way that is easier to read. And in more files, right? Before it was like one big you know, model.bim file. Now it's just 10 or 15 smaller files that have... Okay, here's your tables. Here's your, uh, here's your cultures. The the different languages you want to use. Here's the different measures. So there's I'd now be, files for those things. I'd be shocked if there were no connections into the actual data, which would force a re a republish. Um. Well, I I don't think I think that would. I mean, I would expect a republish to work. Yes, but I would imagine like so. For example, let me think. That's let me think no this small with lift on large models, man. Oh, I would totally agree. Well, and if you have a lot of partitioning going on on those tables, mm -hmm. and you're gonna yeah. you're gonna flip up that. I mean, again, mm -hmm. my but understanding but is that is that is the scenario where this would be the most used, valuable, correct in those big so that models. That is a major migration. Well, let me. I'm gonna push you a bit more on that major migration. Like, yes, it's a Sorry. major migration, it's but a like costly exercise, most likely. I don't know. I don't know how big of an exercise that will actually cost you. If I have to redeploy or republish, and in if I have to republish an entire model in reports that are that is a Not large reports. model. I'm just sorry, that just is, model yeah, the model. The, yeah, just the that model is a large model with many partitions. Now that, that I would a, I agree with. That is a costly exercise because yeah, you're and, and time you, consuming. Especially if you don't have scripting already built out for it to auto load partitions for you. It doesn't you. even matter. It's just a time. It's a time and effort issue. Like it, like for that to cycle and reload all the partitions. 26 gigs of, of data very, or whatever. Very very gigs way later. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, Mike, we've already seen the complications with converting a Power BI PBX that I publish in a Git workspace and some things being lost in translation. So now we have PBIX, potentially a PBIP. You have the project folder, which is a different structure than the PBIP. There's the PBIR. And now we're dealing with Timdle. And you may have the legacy um, JSON structure as well. I don't see Timdle's being as a, that much of a lift, though. I mean, it's not about being a lift. It's about the conversions. Yeah, I just, I mean, we're making an assumption, but. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see whether or not we have to. I, what, I don't. What efforts we have to do to get onto it? Yeah, I mean, I I think the data. If if you had to compare, like, what data is contained in the model.bim and what data is cont contained in now the new Timdle format, there's no difference. There's mm -hmm. no difference in the types and amount of data that's there. It's just the formatting of it will be different. So I think from that perspective, it's not as much of a lift. Now, to your point, Seth, like. Talking about models with large large number of partitions, and you're gonna have to probably redeploy them so that you get the Timdle type formatting. Yeah, and that will be a very large lift for organizations because they now have to plan the downtime to reload all the stuff if they really want to get to this new format. And again, I'm not recommending this format until it gets out of preview. I don't know how long it will stay in preview. This could be a long run inside preview. Like the Azure maps, which was like a preview for like years. This may be something that's in preview for years. I don't know. Because it needs a lot of runtime and testing to get it right. So to that point, I think it, it, it's not something you, you want something you would want to adjust and play around with, but I, I'm not sure I would put production workloads on it right away. Stuff will break. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, stuff, great. Stuff will break. Stuff will break. That's, <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's a technical term. Hey. Break fix. <laughs> well, if if there's anyone who's working on a on a good on a good solution, it's Rui. Like, of all the developers I trust inside the Microsoft ecosystem, personally, I have a relationship with Rui. I know he's amazing. I've seen the stuff he develops in his PBI monitor solution. It's top notch. He's really good. So he understands the developer really well. 
And I think he's going to do a good job of making the right decisions to to get an improvement in the process, but without doing with, with too many, you know, caveats or breaking breaking solutions. That's and that's honestly, as a developer and running a development team, that's hard to do to build new things without breaking all the old stuff. That's a challenge. But I think Rui's got the uh, the right team, and I think he's the right kind of mind to do yeah, that kind of would- thing. I would agree with the, the right mind. I, I mean, Rui is one of the most thorough solution builders I've I've ever seen. Hundred percent, and work and or listen to. So the fact that he's on on mm-hmm. this particular job, yep, uh, should everybody should give everybody the warm and fuzzy. So while we're talking about like how ca- not catastrophic, but like how how it's going to be, <laughs> you know, a pain to migrate onto blah, blah blah. Maybe he's got this already figured out, and he's well, like, oh, you you fools yeah you fool you minor you, you little peons <laughs> well i mean have you ever seen Rui's? Rui did a presentation a while ago where he was doing a circuit of like you know things you can hack in power bi yeah sure. and he was literally going through like all the back-end apis and if you hit this api you could do this and if you hit that api it would spit out a model that had all this formatted stuff in it and he and you could open this pbx file and do this to it and it will still work but if you do that to it it won't I mean, he had like a hundred little nuanced tips and tricks and things that he was getting into that was like all super developer centric. And he was manipulating the PBX file to like a really high degree without, without Microsoft's like, without any of the, the tools without any support. Sure. Like it was yeah. like, it was all unsupported stuff, but it was doing it and it was working and he knew how to make everything run. <laughs> and it we was incredible. Probably like we see what you're doing with all that. Why don't you come over here? And Why don't just, you come on our side and how can you it. build it right? Just fix it. <laughs> <laughs> but everything, a lot of stuff that he developed in his, his, you know, kind of hacking power BI, it was a lot around continu- CI CD. And yeah. it was a lot around, you know, pulling apart the file and getting all the pieces of the file out and he did a lot more like automation, right? If, I, if I'm if i a company, I want to automate or build reports programmatically or build data sets programmatically, you couldn't do it. But Rui was building the things, the, building the components that would let you automate the creation of that stuff. It's it's the developer mindset. It's the it same totally thing is. that you have, Mike, right? Like this, yeah, this I don't know. Is, I, don't, I don't like the, the manual steps I'm taking. This yes. is ridiculous. I will spend however much time it takes me <laughs> to automate this thing so I don't have to do this thing that annoys yes. me. Yes. <laughs> right? Uh, do it once, it. learn it. Do right. it twice, automate it. <laughs> Third time, don't do it again. Like If you're doing something three times, you've spent too much time on it already. You should have automated it in step two. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree on that one. So with that, any other final thoughts? I guess we should do some final thoughts here around final thoughts for Tim Dole. Uh, as we think about this new formatted feature, I, I hope you're enjoying it in desktop. Go out and try it out. Uh, it is a preview feature, so make sure you go into desktop. You have to turn it on inside the settings. So I'm sure someone's going to blog about it, or you'll you know go look at our tweet that's in the in the comment des- the description below here, so you can actually see what it looks like. But um, there's a there's a setting you have to turn on to do that. Any final thoughts, Tommy, for yourself? Man, I am so looking forward for the VS Code extension. I love extensions in VS Code, but to have the syntax highlighting for once for a language for me, I finally get a syntax highlighting just for me uh, in VS Code, which is very exciting. But I think all the other things we're going to be able to do with this. You realize um, that's already out though, right? In preview, but the VS Code oh, extension oh. is not. The VS it's, Code extension is TMDL. It's got a GitHub repo and it's got a whole bunch of nothing in it. Nope, it's out on the. I'm using it right now. It's formatted for me already. Well, there's no link to it, man. It's uh, it's about? literally you Google the extension TMDL, and it's the first yeah. one that shows up. They We're have learning repo. something new on the podcast. Every day. Tommy's learning something new right now. There's dumb repo to update and. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, Microsoft, add links to your extension so people know they're out. It's out nice. there. Yeah. If it's all you have to do it, is all you have to do is talk to Mike. I need to talk to me. Okay. Syntax highlighting highlighting and more coming soon. Yeah, there's okay. more features coming, but it does do the syntax highlighting you're asking it for. Have a logo. And it does yes. and it doesn't have the logo. It, it's literally like a little tiny square. It's so it's very rough. Uh it's in version zero dot three. So it's very early. <laughs> it only has a thousand downloads. So Tommy will be a thousand and one wow. downloads. First, uh, first update, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I'm, 
Well, I'm excited for, again, not just the whole development and the developer side of this, but to really extract and have this readable to share for mm-hmm. all the other things we can feed it into now. There's a lot of cool things coming with this. I totally agree. Seth, kind of final thoughts for you. What do, where do you see this going or, you know, how do you see this using this in your organization? What are your final thoughts? No, I love the incremental steps that um, that we've been seeing in administration and enterprise. Um, the fact that Power BI is part of the Fabric ecosystem, hopefully that's accelerating some of this. Yeah. Um, you know, the the more the better that we can control um, or put put controls around our enterprise reporting and make it easy for ourselves and deployment to treat it like the production product that it is. Um, I'm always a big fan of, so good to see that we're making progress. I'll echo your sentiment there as well, Seth. I, I feel like the story right now for me is look at Power BI, look at it growing up. Like, you know, we're, we're now hitting teenage years right now in Power BI. Mm-hmm. Um, has it been out for in the teens years oh, yet? How many years has it been out now? When, when no. did it start? 2015? Seven, eight. <laughs> Something like that. So we're still, we're, we're not quite, we're, we're not quite at the that teenage tens? years yet. Are we in the tens yet? No, we're. No, we're not. Are we in dog years though? Are we in do, dog do, years? As products, do, like, I don't think, I don't think products go by human years, do they? Like, you I gotta don't know. Get some sort of accelerator. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a translation. There. Right. So. It, it feels to me like we're now in a place where Power BI is now finally growing up. We're getting some really cool tools and Microsoft is listening and competing in the market with, and then building what we want for the enterprise. Like this is, this feels really good. So very pleased to see this happening. Um, Rui, keep up the good work. Really like this. Um, very excited to see where this goes. I'm really hoping that we can get to a place where this is not in preview forever. That's my only concern here. I would like to get stuff out yeah. the door and get it, get it solidified enough that we could say at least some of it's released, at least release portions of Timdall into the ecosystem that lets you use it without it having to be in preview because some companies won't be able to because it's technically in preview still. So I'd like to see some of it released initially uh, to get started and then from there supporting more features as it goes along. So that would be that would be nice. With that, we thank you very much for your time. We, we appreciate your ears. We hope you enjoy this episode around talking about Copilot and this new thing called Timdall. Hopefully it gives you some more information around what these are. Share this with somebody else. If you're talking about this with your company, if you're thinking about enterprise tracking versions of your reports and your semantic models, this is a great uh, tool that will eventually be in your tool belt to help you do that. So definitely take notice of this. And if you find someone else who needs this information, please share the podcast with them as well. Tommy, where else can you find the podcast? You can find us on Apple and Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Make sure to leave a rating. It helps us out a ton. Do you have a question, an idea, or a topic that you want us to talk about in a future episode? Head over to Power BI Tips slash podcast. Leave your name and a great question. Or a mediocre and one. Or a mediocre. We'll even, we'll take it. We may, we'll, even, you know we may even answer those we'll too. We'll spin, we'll spin it. it. We'll, we'll do something. We'll take what we can get right now. So <laughs> maybe we'll create an episode of all of the just mediocre thrown in, qu- the thrown in questions. Yeah. You know, the thrown in questions. Yeah. With that, we appreciate your time. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll see you next Go time ahead. and we appreciate you. We'll, we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you all very much. And we'll see you next time.